So in the takeaway scenario, if I run out after three options and just say whatever, you could come back with I like could a come hot up, dog from the 7-Eleven. I could come back with a yummy baked offal pie <laughs> and say, you didn't. You said you didn't care. And you, and you will have voted for it. You voted for it. You did nothing to stop the awful pie <laughs> being delivered to your door. One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Dead, buried, cremated. Australia's basically done. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. Republic. Just follow the money. G'day and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. Early voting is open and yet there's still mass confusion amongst the general public about how to vote in the Senate after new rules were introduced just before the 2016 federal election. This episode, I'm joined by the Australia Institute's Chief Economist Richard Dennis and Senior Researcher Tom Swan, and we're going to do some plain talking around optional preferential voting. How do preferences work when voting in Australian federal elections? A survey by the Australia Institute suggests that one in two of us don't understand the new Senate voting rules that were introduced at the last election. I think we did a very good job at the last election of informing people of what those changes are, and we're doing the same thing again. The Institute wants the Electoral Commission to urgently review the instructions it gives to voters at the ballot box. It is the season of polling, and the Australia Institute's polling of voters shows that almost half of voters don't know how the new Senate voting rules work. And not even the head of the AEC is explaining it correctly on the nation's public broadcaster. Just Um, remind us what it is. So it's not voting one above the line or every number below the line? That's exactly right. One to six above the line, one to 12 below. But first, how did the old rules work? How did Australian voters used to choose their senators on election day? Well, in the Senate, we used to be able to vote above and below the line, uh, and we still can. But in the old system, to vote above the line, we simply put a one next to the party of our choice. Mm -hmm. And then that party, before the election, had lodged their own ticket, which told the Electoral Commission how to allocate all the rest of your preferences. So you used to buy a package deal from the major parties if you wanted to by just putting a one, or you could vote below the line for the 50 or 100 candidates in the order of your choice. Uh, And that's gone. So if five years ago someone explained Senate voting to you, uh, forget it, you don't understand anymore. It's All that's time, gone. It's gone. It's time <laughs> to learn about the new system. And so what is the new system? Well, the new system is a system of optional preferential voting. You can still vote above and below the line, but you can no longer put a one next to a party and then have that party allocate your preferences for you you now, if you vote above the line, have to express six preferences for the parties of your choice. So a one next to your favourite party, a two next to your second favourite party, a three next to your third favourite party, to at least six, at Mm -hmm. least, and that's the key point. Uh, You can vote all the way across the ticket. So if there's 20 parties above the line, you can vote one to 20, and in fact, I think that's what people should do. Or you can vote below the line for individual candidates. So the individual candidates for each party, but if you vote below the line, you have to vote for at least 12 candidates. But again, you can go all the way to 100 or 150, depending on how many are in your state. And Tom, this new system, uh, the Australian Institute did some polling looking into it. Are many people aware of it? Do they understand it? So we gave uh, a nationally representative sample of, of, of Australians the instructions on the ballot paper. Uh, they weren't expected to remember what Richard just explained, but we gave <laughs> them the instructions on the ballot paper. And it was pretty concerning that uh, there was a lot of confusion about how this system works. So 90% of people got it right that you should vote one for the party you most want to get elected. That's, that's great. Maybe, maybe a bit lower than we might have liked. But <laughs> There's still... some ambiguity there. <laughs> But you can never please some people. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, 
Uh, one in two uh, agreed with the statement that you should give a six to the party you dislike more than any other party on the ballot paper. In other words, putting last. So it seems like there are lots of Australians who are uh, potentially voting six for the party that they dislike more than any other. In fact, even when we gave people the instructions on the ballot paper, more people got that wrong than got it right, which is pretty concerning. The other result that was concerning was that one in three people thought that if you number beyond six, your ballot paper is disqualified. And that is also just completely wrong. Yeah, that's really worrying. So they're getting the one to six message, but they've almost taken it on board too mm. much. It's, it's like the, hearing the number six means that people focus on that so much that they don't hear the rest of the message. Uh, it's at least one to six. You can preference beyond six. And if you want to make sure your vote is as powerful as possible, you really should. These new voting rules were introduced after the 2013 composition of the Senate changed dramatically. Five out of the six states had new senators elected from micro-parties that had never before been represented in the federal parliament, including Ricky Muir from the Motoring Enthusiasts Party, who won on just 0.51% of the primary vote. That's half of 1% of the vote. Thank you, Mr. President. This is not my first... Hang on. It is. <laughs> finally, it may have taken eight months and four days, but finally I'm standing here in this great chamber. Ricky Muir and many of the other senators from micro parties came in on complex systems of preference trading, a fact that ABC election analyst Anthony Green was warning about back before the 2013 election. It is a, an international laughing stock to have the situation where people need magnifying glasses to vote to try and find the candidates they know amongst the flotsam and jetsam. The uh, Senate uh, sheets have previously been called basically tablecloths, but how, how big are they getting? Polling places are only 600 meters, millimetres wide. The ballot paper is one metre. You'll need the, the dexterity of a contortionist to manipulate. The political parties, the minor and micro parties, have just swapped preferences like yeah. a giant game of Twister. They haven't engaged in any ideological position of swapping preferences. An inquiry was held into Senate voting and, on the eve of the 2016 election, Parliament changed the rules. The system has been gamed and it is simply not transparent. I mean, we believe fervently, passionately in a transparent democracy. So how does this new optional preferential voting system work? Now, voters are required to fill out at least one to six above the line or at least one to 12 for individual candidates below the line in the Senate. Oh, everybody understands optional <laughs> preferential voting. We, I don't. Well, well, this is the thing. We were never taught it at school. Mm. We were never taught it at uni. Uh, and when, when you show people the instructions on the ballot paper, as, as Tom says, a lot of people don't understand them. So it's a real problem in a democracy if people don't understand the voting system. Uh, so people shouldn't feel silly if they don't understand. On the contrary, they should feel angry. Uh, that our education system, uh, the, the millions of words typed about our elections, uh, and indeed the Electoral Commission haven't managed to explain it to them. So, uh, so let me have a go where, where those other institutions have <laughs> failed. Because it's not actually that hard. It's just not quite the way people think it is. So um, if you sent me down to the shops for you to get some takeaway and you said, Richard, can you get me a hamburger for dinner? And if there's no hamburgers, can you get me some fish and chips? And if there's no fish and chips, I'd like a pizza. Yeah. You've just given me your preferences in descending order. Yeah. This is what I want first. If I can't get that, this is what I want second. This is what I want. And if I can't get that, this is my third. Now, I might follow up and say, so if there's no hamburgers, chips or pizza, can I get you anything? Now, you might say, no. Nah not hungry, don't care after that. Mm -hmm. Or you might say, oh, yeah, I suppose, worst case scenario, get me a loaf of bread, something's better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's up to you. They're your preferences. Now, when we vote for our political parties, if, if there's 20 parties that are on the top of the ticket and you vote one for the nice party and two for the pretty nice party and three for the not quite as nice as them party, mm -hmm. whatever you think is nice... If you stop preferencing at six and you say nothing about the remaining 14 parties, what you're saying is that you don't care. You think all those 14 other parties are equal. That if you can't get one of your six favourites, you don't care which of the 14 remaining ones get elected. 
Now that's okay, that's, that's legitimate, you might not really care. You might not care whether the Liberals get elected or One Nation get elected. You might not care whether Labor gets elected or the Greens get elected. You might not care uh, whether, uh, whether the Shooters Party gets elected uh, or, or whether One Nation gets elected. And if you don't care, then you shouldn't preference. Mm. But if you do care, you should. But when you vote 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, as the instructions uh, specify, the sixth preference you express is for your sixth favourite party. If that's all you do, you haven't said anything about which party you hate the most and which party you hate the second most. So in the takeaway scenario, if I run out after three options and just say whatever, you could come back with I like could a hot up, dog from the 7-Eleven. I could come back with a yummy baked offal pie <laughs> and say, you didn't. You said you didn't care. And you, and you will have voted for it. You <laughs> voted for it. You did nothing to stop the awful pie <laughs> being delivered to your door. Unfortunately, there is some confusion about the new system, even when people are given the instructions on the ballot paper to vote at least one to six above the line. Write the numbers from one to six next to the names of the people you want to vote for the most in order. Don't worry if you make a mistake. There will be an AEC person there to help you start again. Australian Institute polling found that, given those instructions, one-third, or 32% of voters, believed that numbering the boxes beyond six would see their ballot paper disqualified, which is not true. And almost one in two voters, or 47%, thought that you should put a six next to the party that you dislike more than any other party on the ballot paper. In other words, that putting a six next to a party was effectively the same as putting them last, when in fact it's actually putting them as your sixth favourite preference. And and I think this is where it's very concerning what Tom said before about our polling, that some people have interpreted one, two, three, four, five, six. Some people think putting a six next to a party is putting them last in your list mm. when actually putting the six next to a party is is actually quite a vote of confidence. We, in and we've, we've had a few questions from people who pay a lot more attention than most people to, to voting systems, uh, a few questions about how that can possibly be. But anecdotally, um, talking to people even in the media about these results, um, it's surprised a lot of people that we've spoken to. Um, it seems like, yeah, the results are consistent with our experience in talking about our research. Oh, I confirm that. I've done a number of radio interviews and two radio producers have said to me off air, oh, I thought a six meant putting someone <laughs> last. And, and again, let's not blame them for that. Yeah. No, absolutely. This is a new system. It was only introduced in the lead up to the 2016 election. Uh, and, and again, while, while every fortnight we hear about opinion polls, mm. uh, most people have never heard a, about optional preferential voting. But when explaining the new rules, it seems like everyone gets stuck on the above the line number one to six message. And that's including the man responsible for overseeing our elections, Australian Electoral Commissioner Tom Rogers. That's exactly right. One to six above the line, one to 12 below. One to six above the line, one to 12 below. One to six above the line, one to 12 below. The words at least did not come out of uh, Tom Rogers' mouth uh, this morning. And I stress those words at least because unfortunately a lot of people are hearing that they should just vote one to six and stop there or just vote one to 12 below the line. Now that risks wasting your vote if you like. Uh, Your vote could exhaust, your preferences might not flow on to the candidate uh, that you next most like after six. And voters actually should be encouraged to fill out as many squares as they can to maximise the value and the power of their vote in the Senate. With record high voter enrolment this election, it is important that the true intention of voters is reflected at the ballot box. So the last election was the first election where this new system was used, and it was a double dissolution election which means that you need less votes to get elected. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the first time the system has been used in a normal half-Senate election, this election. Um, But we do have some experience from last time. So um, 90% of people voted above the line. Mm -hmm. um, And most of those people, I think it was 87% of those people voted 1 to 6. So Mm -hmm. people are seeing the 1 to 6 
and they've got that locked in their mind and they're following the, what they think is either the minimum or the maximum amount of preferences. Around 6%, I think it was, certainly um, an, another chunk voted less than 6 and there were some people who still voted 1, thinking mm-hmm. about the old system. And very few voted beyond 6. So it's actually... Most people vote above the line, and of people who vote above the line, very few are going beyond six. And that means that most people are not expressing their preferences beyond what they're saying the top six are. Um, And every box they're leaving blank, they're effectively giving uh, the vote to someone else who has expressed that preference. Mm. Um, They're essentially saying, as Richard has said, I don't care amongst all of the candidates I'm leaving blank. Um, and so I'm happy to let someone else decide the outcome for me. And again, anecdotally, I just don't feel like that story checks out. <laughs> I know I myself find huge satisfaction in finding the mm. most loathsome candidate and putting them last. I always start from the bottom. <laughs> I always start from the bottom. If there are 20 parties, you start at 20 and work up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, it's, I think it's really important. We've heard so much in recent years from the Liberals about what, what an extreme party the Greens are and mm. what a threat the Greens are to our economy and our society. Well, if that's what the Liberals really believe, then they should be telling their voters, they should be telling voters that respect the Liberal Party's uh, analysis the Liberals should be saying, put the Greens last. And, you, and the, the Liberal Party should be saying, please vote Labor ahead of the Greens because we, the Liberals, think the Greens are particularly uh, dangerous for, for the economy or something else. And similarly, uh, if progressive voters really believe that One Nation are particularly pernicious and have a unique potential to harm our society then those same progressive voters really should be preferencing, stating a preference on their ticket to elect a Liberal before uh, a One Nation candidate is elected. Because if you are silent about that, if you just put numbers next to the parties you like, then you're not expressing to the Electoral Commission that you have a real preference to keep someone out. So putting someone last is very important on a ballot paper but last means literally last. Uh, one to six does not get you to last uh, in, in any state or territory. That's why I don't want their preferences. I want their primary votes, because that's the right thing for Australia. Voting Greens in the Senate gives you a voice in Parliament. So you put one nation last. Yeah. We'll be determining that at the time of nominations closing, because frankly, we think Labor and the Greens would be far worse for the economy. Not once have we been talking to Clive Palmer about preferences because we understand it's a That's recipe for true, chaos. Alex. A recipe for chaos. That's why we're putting One Nation and Clive Palmer, we're not in negotiations with them. We've heard a lot this election campaign about putting last. There's been big debates about who different parties will put last in their preferences. What we haven't heard is the explanation of what it means to put someone last. Mm. Uh, it, it, it certainly doesn't mean putting them six. That's your sixth best. Uh, and it does mean ultimately filling out every preference above the line or below the line so that you can make sure that the person you absolutely loathe more than anyone else goes at the end of your preferences. Yeah, if and you don't want awful really pie, yeah. you've got to put it last. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's really hard to pick the... The, the, mm. the worst and the second last mm. worst. But, like there's, you know. but sorry to be grandiose, this is what democracy is all about. Mm. It, it is about making hard choices. Mm. And once every three years we're given that opportunity and if we just put a one to six next to the parties we like the most, we're actually skipping out of the hard mm. bit. You know, we will have a parliament after the next election. It will have 76 senators in it. And if you don't express a preference for which of the parties that you don't like, which one you don't like the most, if you don't express a preference, then other people's Mm. preferences will determine the outcome. And it's like uh, our analysis has shown of the Senate as well. The crossbench, once again, is going to play an incredibly important role. And often the crossbench comes from that last sixth seat in each state that can, you know, swing the numbers. And often that ends up being a choice between Liberals and a minor party, Labor and a minor party, or between a couple of different left and right wing parties. Absolutely. Let me make one prediction with 100% certainty. Uh, On election night, we will not know the composition of the Senate. Uh, It will take weeks to count and decide who exactly will be in the Senate. 
and there is no doubt that the that the last Senate seat in each state will go to preferences. Mm. Yep. And if you're not expressing preferences all the way down the ticket, then your ballot paper won't be involved mm. in those final counts to determine who gets that six Senate seat in each state. And and in allowing your ballot paper to exhaust, as they say, you're essentially allowing other people to, to determine the outcome. Um, in effect, you're... Um, helping other parties be elected by not expressing preferences. You're, just, you're saying, I don't care, I'm happy for someone else to decide. Uh, you're, you're essentially helping um, other people uh, to elect their preferences instead of your own. And that's something that our polling showed that people don't understand. 67% of people think if you don't give a party a number, you can't help them get, get elected. But as we've just explained, that's not true. Mm. And so what advice is the AEC giving to voters? Well, the AEC, in its written advice, is making clear that people have to express a, at least one to uh, sorry, at least six preferences. They mm-hmm. have to number at least one to six. But we know at the last election, not everyone was told that when they were handed their ballot paper. I wasn't. And unfortunately, we even heard the electoral commissioner himself on, on radio recently say, "You just have to vote one to six. So the written advice from the electoral commission is obviously correct, but whether that message is is being pumped out to ten million voters very effectively or not, well, we'll have to wait till after the election. The written advice is correct, but as our polling shows, even when presented with the written advice on the ballot paper, many people still get it completely wrong and um, I think it would have been wise before we implemented this new voting system to actually test how people uh, understand it and what they what their behaviour is in response to the written instructions because it seems like uh, it's not doing anywhere near as well as it should. Yeah, and certainly at the very least there's still mass confusion. Mm. The, the Electoral Commission says quite rightly that it's a new system and there's going to be a learning process, and that's fine, but uh, with the learning process we'd like to see a bit of a teaching process to explain how this new system works and explain the consequences of uh, doing the minimum as set out on the on the ballot paper. Well, and, and constitutionally, there's no mention of a learning process. Um, <laughs> once a parliament is elected, the laws it makes uh, are binding, regardless of whether it was a, a bit of a test run for, <laughs> for electoral information. So, to be clear, for everyone who maybe didn't know that there was a new voting system or know but aren't quite sure how it works... How should people vote? What's the advice? When you get your ballot paper for the Senate, you should express as many preferences as you possibly can. If you vote above the line, you should express a preference for every party from your favourite all the way down to the party you hate the most. And if you vote below the line, you should express as many preferences as you can, ideally from the candidate you like the most to the candidate you like the least. Uh, it's, a, it's formal, it's legal to vote for less, but if you express less preferences than, than is possible, if you're silent about most parties or most candidates, then your ballot will not be as powerful. So just to repeat that, in the Senate, if you vote above the line, you must, at the very least, vote one to six. You can number every box, though, and we urge you to number as many preferences as you possibly can from your favourite party all the way to the party that you hate the most. Or if you vote below the line in the Senate, you must at the very least vote 1 to 12. You can number every box, though, below the line, and we urge you to number as many preferences as you possibly can from your favourite candidate all the way to the candidate you think is the worst. Enjoy putting someone last. Take, <laughs> take the time. You only do it every three years, sometimes even less. Um, take the time, savour putting someone last, filling out every box. Here, here. That's been episode 35 of Follow the Money, brought to you by the Australia Institute. It was recorded on the 6th of May in Canberra with Richard Dennis and Tom Swan. So a couple of things may have changed since we recorded. To read the Australia Institute's polling on the new Senate voting rules, you can go to our website at tai.org.au. We're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Richard Dennis is at rdns underscore tai. And Tom Swan is at tom underscore swannn. 
This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy and Lizzie Jack. Our theme music is by Jonathan McPhee from Pulse and Thrum. And you can find more of his music at pulseandthrum.com. Thanks for listening. This episode is authorised by E. Bennett for the Australia Institute, Canberra.